Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, good morning. I'm Joe Reagan with the RCGA. It's great to have you here this morning for our breakfast with the gazelles. We're really delighted uh, that uh, about our speaker this morning and about the service that he provides and leadership he provides in this community. We appreciate you taking your valuable time to be here to learn and to contribute to this morning's uh, program. You know, we believe you're here because you care about this bi-state region and about the growth in the St. Louis community across Illinois and Missouri. And certainly, we are very much aware that we compete as that bi-state region in an ever more complex global economy. A, a economy that is um, very challenging, a lot of change going on in everyone's business, and an economy that this region, I believe, is very well positioned to succeed in, but only if we work together to do one thing, and that is to make more pie. One of my favorite Kentuckians told me there's only two ways to get more pie. I think he said pie, <laughs> which is you either grab more pie or you bake more pie. And I think that's what you're here today in a chamber of commerce to do, to help make more pie, to grow the market, to grow the abundance, to grow the opportunity for not only us as individuals but in our businesses and organizations, but for those who follow us uh, in this wonderful community. We certainly have a very clear and ambitious direction and goal that we're pursuing, and that is to help this region get back to the top 10 of the top 20 U.S. metropolitan areas in terms of prosperity, in terms of regional vitality, economic health, and the creation of community wealth. This is where we deserve to be as a region. This is where we once were as a region. This is where we can be. We are a great community, but we can be in greater St. Louis if we were working together. And I don't think, and I think this is really goes to what Pat Sly may be talking about today, because it's certainly what I've observed with him as a leader and with Emerson as a leader. And that is that we don't want to be just best in mid-America or best in the United States, but we want to be best in the world. We want to be globally excellent as a region. Our region has many entrepreneurial risk takers, and innovators and explorers who are working to build this new reality. We're celebrating this week in, in uh, St. Louis, as we are all over the world, Global Entrepreneurship Week. Across the street at our uh, uh, joint venture called T-Rex over the weekend, we had a tremendous turnout of new startup companies that got together on Friday night with ideas, and by Sunday night they had formed companies and teams and now out looking for funding. Uh, this Later this week, tomorrow, actually, I get to join uh, my friend Donald Suggs at the uh, podium to recognize emerging leaders, emerging in, uh, entrepreneurs from our diverse business community and uh, minority business entrepreneurs in our Salute to Excellence luncheon tomorrow. Donald, look forward to that. So we have this great entrepreneurial uh, um, culture here, and it's produced that entrepreneurism and innovation over a period of time has produced some clear strengths. Strengths in our economy in financial services. Strengths in our economy in employers around health sciences and services. Strengths from those who employ in the multimodal industries. And that really is that intersection between river and road and rail and runways. And now, more importantly than ever, is routers, the IT infrastructure that ties all that together. This is an area where Emerson has been particularly a leader for us in helping us understand the potential. And in our strengths around biosciences. You know, it's, it's sometimes we don't think of or realize this, and it certainly is it's going to become a clear uh, thing we have to realize it when, as Congress deals with the fiscal issues ahead. 
that Washington Med Medical School is the third largest medical school in the country to receiving NIH funding. It's the third largest. That's a huge amount of investment that's in this community right now that we may or may not be aware of each day. So we have a lot of strengths to build on in this quest to being 10. And, and quite frankly, before, um, if we, before we get on to uh, a Pat, I think there's some really key employment uh, data that we should share. Um, we're, make, we're, we're seeing some slight improvements in this very tough economy. The September seasonally adjusted unemployment rate for the region is 7.4 percent. And since March 2012, the region's unemployment rate has been at, at or below the U.S. rate. The October employment data for the state of Missouri and for St. Louis showed continuing improvement. St. Louis added 9,100 jobs between September and October. And when comparing 2011 to 2012, the region added 15,200 jobs for a growth rate of 1.2 percent. Now, positive growth, but none of us are satisfied with that, satisfied with that kind of uh, rate. In the four industry sectors that we've mentioned in terms of strengths, financial, healthcare, logistics, we're really gaining momentum. The pace over the year, year over year growth in these sectors has increased steadily for the first three quarters of this year. And October figures show this trend continuing to hold. Probably most importantly, though, is news that you heard yesterday. And that is that this region had the highest gain in college completion rates of any metropolitan area in the country, the top 35 from between 2007 and 2010. That, folks, is the most important number, and, and that is not easy to do. So I think that deserves a celebration. And we heard that from a movement called St. Louis Graduates, which we highly support, which is a, a movement toward uh, helping uh, getting 50 percent of our community with a bachelor's degree or higher by 2020. We're delighted to recognize our media sponsor today, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Some of the representatives are here this morning. We thank the Post-Dispatch for helping sponsor our RCA, RCGA breakfast with the Gazelles program. Our presenter has two topics, and both are timely and important for all of us, growing a multinational business in a challenging global economy, and Emerson's charitable trust funding priorities. Patrick J. Sly is Executive Vice President of Emerson and Business Leader, Emerson Commercial and Residential Solutions. Pat is Business Leader for Emerson Commercial and Residential Solutions, which has sales of $1.8 billion in 2011. He also oversees the Emerson Charitable Trust and the company's community giving activities, a position he is, was appointed to in 2012. In addition, he's in, he is an Advisory Director to Emerson's Board of Directors. Pat began his career at Emerson, Emerson in 1980 as national sales manager for Power Tools and subsequently held several positions of increasing responsibility with the Emerson tool business, including executive vice president for sales and marketing and president. He became president of, the Ridge, of Ridge Tool in 1993 and assumed additional duties at Emerson Group vice president in 1998 and was promoted to senior vice president in 1999. He's promoted to Executive Vice President in 2000. Pat currently serves on the St. Louis University Board of Trustees and the Boards of Directors of Boys Hope, Girls Hope, and for Day and Tomorrow Education Foundation. He also serves as Vice Chair of the Nine Network of the Public Media, of Public Media and is a member of the Board of Directors of our organization, the St. Louis Regional Chamber and Growth Association. Pat received his bachelor's degree in business administration from Benedictine College in Kansas and an MBA from St. Louis University. Pat has been incredibly welcoming to me and to my family, and Emerson has been very supportive of the RCGA in so many corners, and their CEO, David Farr, uh, could not have been more welcoming and encouraging to me as a member of the search committee uh, to um, uh, ask me to come to uh, St. Louis, including one Saturday evening when he when the phone rang at my home and it was David Farr on the line and um, he's fairly persuasive. <laughs> Pat Sly. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm looking forward to this meeting a lot more than I am uh, St. Louis University Board of Trustees meeting that I have <laughs> this afternoon. I'll, I'll leave it at that. 
Uh, what I want to share with you this morning are just a, a little overview of Emerson and what we're doing to, to grow in, a, in an extremely challenging global environment, economic environment, and uh, also to talk about the charitable trust, as Joe mentioned. Um, one thing I found interesting about St. Louis is we don't know much about our multinational corporations that are headquartered here. I was at an event Sunday night and someone came up to me and, and said, uh, I hear you have a Black Friday ad at Walmart on your HDTV, the Emerson HDTV. <laughs> and I said, that's not Emerson Electric. That's a, that's a broker in New Jersey that imports cheap appliances and puts the Emerson brand on it. And we haven't been able to take that trademark off. Uh, so we are not that business. <laughs> so if you see cheap radios and cheap TVs, that's not Emerson. Uh, <clears throat> before I get started, I just, just want to say, Make sure I can advance these things. Uh, this is not your father's Emerson Electric. I joined Emerson uh, 32 years ago, and Emerson at that time was a leading motor manufacturer. We were in the defense industry, and we were a, a huge player in tools and appliances to some degree. Uh, when I was here in 1980, we made most of the Craftsman power tools for Sears Roebuck. Sears was Emerson's largest customer in 1980, and actually through the 80s. Uh, that's changed a lot. Sears is almost non-existent. Um, we made motors for Whirlpool. Uh, our acquisition strategy back in the early 80s was, what does Sears and Whirlpool want us to buy? And what does the government want us to do with the defense industry? So we're a, a very different company today. Uh, through the 80s and 90s, we were very, very engineering focused. We still are. But uh, we kind of internally called ourselves, you know, if, if you build it, they will come. And we learned in the late 90s that marketing was extremely important and that it had to be all about end user solutions, getting closer to our end users and providing solutions. So we changed our whole, uh, whole way of going about communicating. We started using an overbrand or umbrella brand of Emerson in most of our platforms. Uh, which we never did before. I was talking to someone earlier from Procter & Gamble. They would never put the Procter & Gamble logo on any of their products because they wanted to go by the individual brands. Emerson used to be that way. We're not that way anymore. We're Emerson Network Power. We're Emerson Commercial and Residential Solutions. We're Emerson Process Management and so on. So what I want to do uh, briefly today is take you through very quickly an overview of our businesses that we're in and how we're organizing ourselves strategically, the, the investments we're making globally to grow this company in a difficult environment. And then I'll close with a little bit about the trust. In 2012, we just ended our fiscal year uh, at the end of September, 24.4 billion. Uh, we've been here in St. Louis since 1890. We're not going anywhere. Uh, we're not moving to New York. <laughs> we're uh, number 120 on the uh, Fortune 500 list of America's largest corporations. This is a look at our five business platforms. Um, as I said earlier, when I joined Emerson in 1980, we were primarily commercial and residential solutions and defense. I run the commercial and residential solutions business today, so I've, over the last 32 years, managed to take us from about 60% of the business down to eight. <laughs> so I've, I've done a hell of a job. But. It, it, is our, it is our most profitable business segment because we have some very strong brands in that business. But where we have invested, as you can see, process management is, still, is, is now our largest business, network power, industrial automation, and climate technologies. Uh, and when I joined Emerson, we were about 20% uh, international. Today, we're about 55%. So very different company. This is just a look at our performance. Uh, we just released our earnings uh, in November, early November. At $2.67 a share, uh, the normalized earnings were $3.39, but we took a huge impairment charge uh, to write off some business investments in the network power area. So we were, uh, on a normalized basis, $3.39. Our cash flow was close to the $3.39. So we were able to continue increasing our dividend for the 56th consecutive year. Our brand promise, and we developed this about 12 years ago when we decided uh, not to be such an engineering-focused company, but to go out and communicate that we're all about solutions. 
where technology and engineering come together to create solutions for the benefit of our customers, driven without compromise for a world in action. We invest in new technology to meet our customers' needs. We spend about 3% of sales on engineering and development. Over 9,000 engineers and development personnel worldwide. We have huge engineering centers now in India and China. 32% uh, of our new products or 30, we have 32% of our products are new products as a percent of our sales. We define a new product as a product that uh, has been with us for less than five years. After five years, it rolls over and there has to be another innovation or another uh, technology leap to, to be part of that new product definition. And we have 1,600 new patents earned in 2012. Uh, we're a, a leader a global leader in our core businesses and markets. I'm not going to go through every one of these, but as you can see, in network power, we're number one AC and DC power systems, embedded power. Uh, in process management, we're number one in the world in control valves, measurement devices, and wireless devices. If you ever go into an oil refinery anywhere in the world, you're going to see Emerson Process Management. Uh, on climate technologies, number one in the world in compressors and controls. Industrial automation, number one in alternators, fluid control, and ultrasonic welding. And in my businesses, we're number one in food waste disposers. If you don't own an incinerator, you're in the minority. We have about a 92% market share. Uh, plumbing tools, professional plumbing tools under the rigid brand. Uh, not many people know that we're the world leader in wet dry vacuums. And we are literally shipping thousands, tens of thousands a day to the Northeast. Uh, because of Hurricane Sandy. So it's been a nice boost in our business and hopefully we're helping out some people that, that need our products. And then we're also number one on mobile point of care carts for hospitals. We're recognized for our growth performance and management excellence. I'm not going to sit here and brag about all the awards, but uh, we, we've done a lot around the world. David Farr is now recognized as one of the best CEOs in America. I've only worked with him for 31 years, and we kind of followed each other, and I'm through following him. I'm staying where I am, but uh, actually replaced him at, at Ridge Tool in Cleveland, Ohio, when he went to Asia. I was there for five years, but Dave's done an outstanding job of transforming this company from what we were to, to what we are today. Uh, the advertising campaign I talked about, uh, it's no longer we will build it, and they, or if we build it, they will come. It's now about providing solutions for end users. And that's what we like to say differentiates us uh, from the rest of our global competitors. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go through the five business platforms and give you an overview of what we do. I'm not going to read a lot of this. I'll let you look at the slides. But uh, process management is our largest platform by far. Uh, they make technologies and services for, for smarter operations. Uh, intelligent control systems, software measurement, I'm not going to read it all, but if you go in any pulp and paper, or chemical plant, or oil refinery, anywhere in the world, you're going to see Emerson Process Management. The software, the, uh, the valves, the instruments, the actuators, everything that makes that operation run. Uh, it's a big service business, too, because we have to service what we sell. And uh, it's very, very uh, difficult once we're in to have us replaced because of the installed base. It costs millions and millions of dollars to replace a capital investment that we make at process management. This is just a look. They're just under $8 billion of sales in 2012. They'll probably pass the $9 billion mark this year. They're growing faster than any of our other platforms. Uh, their big customers include Bayer, Chevron, ExxonMobil, Floor, Petrobras is a very big customer, oil business in Brazil. And these are the products they make and where they sell them. Very, very international company. These are their core offerings and key brands. Most of you probably aren't familiar with those, but uh, I guarantee you they are very familiar brands in the rest of the world. In network power, it's all about enabling business critical continuity, backup power systems, uh, chargers. We make, if, if anybody has a, an iPad, we made the charger <laughs> over in uh, southern China. And uh, we're cranking a lot of those out. But uh, grid to chip technologies and expertise that keeps data centers, telecom networks, and business applications up and running. 
and keeping them energy efficient. This is just a look at their sales, six and a half billion. Uh, they have customers all over the world. We had uh, some of our impairment charges that I talked about earlier re were related to uh, primarily the telecom business, uh, which is softened around the world, especially in China. So we had to take a right down there, but you can see the, the types of products they make, uh, very diverse, and again, very, very international, with only 38% of their sales in the United States and Canada. These are their core offerings and key brands. Uh, Liebert, uh, backup power systems and in uh, data storage areas, provides the environmental uh, air conditioning and so on for those, for those uh, data centers. And we've made some acquisitions recently, at Avacent and Chloride. Chloride's a British company, a big British company that does the same thing. In climate technologies, we, uh, we lead the world in uh, compressors for residential heating and air conditioning, commercial heating and air conditioning, and refrigeration. They're about a $3.8 billion business. Again, uh, very international, but not as much as the first two that I showed you. They're about 55% United States and Canada. And their big customers, have, they have a lot of OEM customers, which means that they provide uh, parts and products for Lennox and people like that, original equipment manufacturers. So these are their big manufacturers. They have a very, very high global market share in compressors for refrigeration and air conditioning because they have patented technology with a scroll compressor. These are their uh, core offerings and key brands. Uh, one you may recognize for those that are from St. Louis, White Rogers is one of uh, the climate technologies business units. Used to be headquartered in Afton and we moved it to our campus a few years ago. Emerson Industrial Automation, another one of our five business platforms, uh, specialized products, technologies, and integrated solutions for the world's industrial manufacturing economy. Uh, these are the types of products that they make. So, so far you don't see HD TVs or <laughs> you don't even see motors anymore. Uh, their sales, $5.2 billion. They're very international, 59% international and 41% U.S. and Canada. <clears throat> these are the types of products they make. Uh, we did divest our appliance motor business uh, a couple years ago but we still make the large motors and drives uh, for things like elevator systems in Hong Kong and so on and so forth uh, that we're in this business platform. This is just a look at uh, their core offerings and key brands. Uh, none of those business units are in St. Louis. Uh, many of them are headquartered in Western Europe. And then the, the business that I have, a little less than $2 billion, these are the primary brands. Uh, many of you have heard of the Rigid brand. They're the worldwide leader in plumbing tools, but we've now taken them into diagnostics and test and measurement. And we have a license agreement with Home Depot. So if, if you go in there, you see a lot of products that have the Rigid brand on that many of them we don't make. We just collect royalties. There's a really good return on that. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, closet made in residential storage in metro in healthcare and commercial storage. And then in Syncorator, <clears throat> the world leader in waste disposers. A uh, little less than $2 billion. This is a very much a North American centric business. 83% of our business is in the U.S. and Canada. We only have two businesses that are really global in nature. One is Rigid and the other one uh, would be Intermetro in healthcare and commercial storage. Uh, we just built a plant for Insincorator in Nanjing, China. <clears throat> We're trying to uh, you know, make a big step in Asia with that investment. Just to look at our core offerings and key brands, uh, one of the uh, major investments we've made recently, we, we've made three small acquisitions in healthcare uh, for point of, point of care storage and medical dispensing systems. And we're continuing to invest in that space. So a really good platform. Again, this is our most profitable platform, but it's also our smallest. Now I want to just take you into where we're going and, and how we're going to get there. Uh, how we can grow above economic indicators globally. A lot of it has to do with our international strategic investments. 
uh, a great deal that has to do with that. If you look back in 1990, when 36 percent of our business was international, to today, about 59 percent. And what's more important, if you look at emerging markets, uh, we've gone from practically nothing to about 36 percent of our sales, and we're driving to 45 percent of our sales uh, by 2022, with 65 percent of our sales international. So. It's not because we're not investing in the United States, it's because these markets are growing faster than the markets in the United States. We're still uh, very, very much uh, invested in the U.S. and will continue to be. And I'll show you, show you in a few minutes, we think the U.S. and what I call North America and the NAFTA countries are going to be a very, very important part of our growth in the next few years. This is our global presence in 2012. Uh, the U.S. is our largest sales market, U.S. and Canada, 11 billion, followed by Asia Pacific at just 6 billion, and then Western Europe at 3.9, and the others are around 1, 1 and a half billion. Uh, but our objective here is to design, engineer, and manufacture and sell in the regions that we operate in. In other words, we, we don't have an export business model. Uh, if we're selling garbage disposers in China, we're going to make them in Nanjing, China. If we're selling products in Brazil, we're going to make those products in Brazil. It's not an export model. Uh, the gross fixed investment, for what I mean by that are, are structures and buildings and software uh, investments around the world. It's a, a indicator, economic indicator that we follow very closely in most of our businesses. You can see here in uh, the mature markets, we're looking at three-year growth of about two to three percent. Uh, this year will be about two to three percent. In the emerging markets, we're looking at growth about 5 to 6 percent, so they mix up our overall growth. So instead of growing at 2.5 percent in just mature markets, we'll be able to grow just under 4 percent uh, when you look at the mix of emerging markets that we have. So extremely important part of our business. This is kind of an interesting chart. I know it's a little busy, but it's uh, infrastructure investment around the world. And I think the key takeaways here would be uh, the fact that uh, China has gone from 3% of the world's infrastructure investment in 1992 to 18% today, going to 22%. And where that came from is primarily Japan and Western Europe. Uh, I think it's important to note that in the United States, we're holding our own. We're holding our own and expect to continue to hold our own in 2017-2022 as a percent of the world's infrastructure investment. So that's encouraging to me. And these numbers come from a lot of different econo economists that provide us the information. Um, we'll continue to make strategic investments, international investments in emerging markets and international markets. Uh, we have to because they're growing faster than the mature markets. You can see the, the type of growth here. Uh, gross fixed investment in 1992 was 20% in emerging markets. It's at 52% today, going to 54%. And this is a percentage of our sales, from 9% up to 36% during this 20-year time frame. And it's because that's where the infrastructure investment is being made. Uh, our investments are paying off. Uh, you can see here that from 2005 to 2010, 65 percent of our growth was in emerging markets. It's only 35 percent of our growth was in mature markets. But as we look forward in 2010 to 2012, we're seeing mature markets with the exception of Western Europe coming back pretty strong in terms of gross fixed investment, infrastructure investment. So we're pretty highly encouraged by this. And if you look at uh, it, how this mixes, Mature markets from 5 to 12 at 3.8, emerging at 13.2, it mixes us up to 6.5%. And as a company, we try to grow our base business between 5 and 7% through cycles, through economic cycles. That's our target. So 6.5% would not have been possible, obviously, without the emerging market growth. And from 2010 to 2012, we see mature markets have come back a little bit, again, because, with the exception of Western Europe. And emerging markets have slowed down a little bit. Um, part of that's China, and I'd say a big part of it's Brazil. So emerging market 
as a percent of our sales have gone from 23 to 34 to 36 in the last seven years. Uh, these are our, our, our key near-term growth opportunities in these top regions of the world. Uh, in the U.S. and Canada, we're, we're pretty optimistic, actually. Uh, hopefully, we'll get over this fiscal cliff and get our act together in Washington, D.C., but assuming we do, uh, we're very optimistic about the next few years. Um, expanded oil and gas exploration. I know some of you have read the articles recently that you know we could actually be energy independent by 2022. I'm not sure if that'll actually happen, but uh, that would really help Emerson, and it would really help the United States. So I'm hoping it happens. Mexico is uh, one of our fastest growing markets. Uh, we've got a great partnership with Pemex, which is the, the Mexican state-owned uh, oil company. Uh, and that's a top priority over the next three years to invest in Mexico. Eastern Europe and Russia, again, it's all about natural resources and our investment there in infrastructure development. It's an extremely important uh, market for our process management business. China uh, will take advantage of our investments in the region that we've been making. Uh, we expect to grow about two points higher than gross fixed investment in China over the next few years because We've made these investments. We've made a lot of investments in China, and we're hoping that they pay off. And then finally, Southeast Asia and Australia, uh, we've got to rebalance our Asia portfolio. There, there are companies in Asia that are growing faster than others. Southeast Asia is starting to take off. We did not have a lot of investment in places like Indonesia and Malaysia and the like, and we're shifting a lot of investment into those countries uh, away from China to some extent, where we're already pretty mature. So the key messages here uh, is short term, we think the macroeconomic conditions will deteriorate from where they were, okay? Uh, that doesn't mean they're falling off the cliff. It just means that they're going to be slower than where they were. The global gross fixed investments forecasted to grow only 2.5% in 2013, and it's primarily being dragged down by Western Europe's recession. Uh, there are many world areas that will struggle to continue investment, but there are pockets of growth to exploit, and Emerson is in a great position to be able to do that. Uh, the emerging markets will continue to give us huge growth opportunities, and the energy and residential investment potential in North America, I think, is going to be great. Uh, the businesses that I have are heavily tied to residential investment in the U.S., and a company, I don't know if you've heard the brand Closet Made, to just give you an example. Um, they make residential storage uh, for home improvement and new housing and so on. That, that's a business that went from $600 million to $300 million in a period of a few years as housing crashed in the United States. Well, that's starting to come back, and a company like that will start growing at double digits for the next several years as a result. And uh, we've done a lot of restructuring in those businesses that were impacted, so we'll be able to uh, leverage on the way up and really create some value for our shareholders. Uh, the fiscal cliff looms. Uh, anybody that reads a newspaper knows that, and we're, we're very hopeful that uh, someone in Washington will take a leadership role and, and fix it. So that's all I have on the business piece, and I want to switch over to uh, a little bit about community affairs and charitable trust, and then I'll open it up to questions. Uh, this is our mission and charter and our charitable trust to support organizations and institutions that play significant roles in enhancing the quality of life where we work and where we live. That's not just St. Louis, that's around the United States and to some degree around the world, although most of our trust is focused on the United States primarily because of the, the culture of philanthropy in the United States versus the rest of the world. Uh, we started the trust in 1975 and since then we've uh, given away over $480 million to Emerson communities around the United States. Uh, these are the five areas of focus for our giving, arts and culture, uh, civic education at all levels, health and human services, and youth. Uh, during fiscal 12, uh, we gave away $32 million uh, to 3,400 charities and nonprofit organizations, and this is how it was distributed. Education was the biggest piece. And that ranges anywhere from uh, underserved youth education to 
higher institutions, the Washington U's, the St. Louis Universities, the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and so on. So health and human services being next, and arts and culture, civic, and youth. Another breakdown of the 3,400 plus organizations and the dollars that went to each of these areas. And the types of contributions that we did uh, in 2012, about 11% were what we call annual gifts. Uh, they're not multi-year commitments, but they're uh, very important. Uh, they're like the United Way, the corporate gift to United Way, that type of gift. And then multi-year pledges are, are pretty big. Uh, some of these are capital campaigns and others are for uh, other investments. And then other gifts from corporate, 6.3 million, and our operating divisions, about 7.5 million. Those are operating divisions within the United States. We also have a China Trust, China Foundation, separate from this that reports through me, but it's not nearly as large as what we do here. This is just some examples of the types of giving in each of the five categories that we've done. Uh, in arts and culture, J Magic House, the public library, uh, we have a big gala at the city library. We made a big investment in the city library. I think Saturday night is the official gala opening. And that's, that's quite a quite an interesting place if you get a chance to look at it. Uh, Nine Network of Public Media, since I'm vice chair, I have to make sure that we take care of the Nine Network. I know Jack Gelmish is here somewhere. He probably appreciates that. Uh, civic, uh, I'm not gonna read each one of these, you can read them. Education, Health and Human Services, uh, obviously led by the United Way, and Youth. So our funding priorities uh, our number one programs, number two capital, third general support, and fourth endowment. We're not really big on endowment, but we have done some investment in that area. So, you know, for a capital campaign, when we look at a capital campaign, and we're invested in several right now, uh, these are the areas we look for. What impact is the organization making in the community? Is there broad-based financial support? Uh, one of the things that, that drives me crazy is when an uh, institution or an agency comes to us and says, you know, we have a $10 million campaign and we'd really like $4 million from Emerson. And I'll say, well, who else in the community is part of this? And they say, well, we haven't gone there, but we need the leadership gift from Emerson before we can ask anybody else. Well, I'm not going to give you $4 million or 40% of your campaign before you get any support from the rest of the community. So it's something we struggle with, but uh, with some changes in the St. Louis community, uh, Anheuser-Busch now being owned by InBev, uh, part, of the, part of the changes, and then other, other large companies that have moved their headquarters outside of the United States, or outside of St. Louis, like uh, the old McDonnell Douglas is now Boeing and their headquarters in Chicago and so on. There's a lot more pressure on Emerson, and we, $32 million is a lot of money to give away every year. So, but we have to be very, very careful and diligent about how we allocate those resources. So we, we look at governance, we look at the strategic plan of the organization, and obviously the history of supporting the organization, uh, what we've done in the past, and has that been successful? So that's all I have uh, formally. It looks like we have at least 15 minutes to take any questions that anyone might have. Yeah, I have some help with that, but thank you. My question is, yeah. is, your, is your charitable budget um, tied to, to revenue? Or how it's tied, revenue? It's, it's capped at one percent, one-tenth of one percent of our pre-tax profit, okay? That's where we're capped. So I have to go to the finance committee of the board once a year and get approval for a budget based on the forecast for that upcoming year. Since we're looking at a, a pretty flat year, we have a very flat charitable trust budget for 2013. And one of the struggles that I have is that we have some commitments out there when we were growing for multi-year gifts that keep going like this, and the budget's like this, so I have to fix annual gifts in order to continue with some of the multi-year commitments that we made. So 
we're struggling with that, but we'll get through it. Yeah, in the back. Uh, yeah. uh, just a follow-up question regarding your uh, philanthropic support. Uh, uh, how would a uh, emerging or fairly new uh, nonprofit organization uh, best make a approach? I know your history is a criteria, but new applicants don't have that history. So. Uh, where and how does that start? Well, the, the best thing to do would be to send me the material about your organization, and if you have a specific proposal, put that in. And if we have some interest, we'll arrange a meeting and go from there. So we're very open to new ideas. Sounds Thanks. simple. It sounds simple. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But there's only 24 hours in a day, too. So. Yeah. Yes. Elaborate a little on the culture of uh, philanthropy between the different uh, countries you serve. Uh, that'll be real simple. It's all in the U.S. There's no philanthropy culture outside the United States. Um, zero in Western Europe, zero in Asia, a little bit in Latin America. But outside the United States, it's, that's the government's problem. That's the government. There's no, there's no such thing as a United Way type organization in Europe, for instance, because the tax structure is such that that's the government's problem. And uh, I hope we don't end up there. Uh, I personally don't like the direction we're going in the United States. We're becoming Western Europe in some sense. But I think it's very, very important that we, we keep a culture of philanthropy in this country. To, to help organizations where we want to send the money and not funneled through Uncle Sam. So, yes. Such a diverse organization. Talk to us a little bit about uh, the way in which you deal with decentralization, for example, in managing your companies or how you manage that wide flung uh, uh, yeah, process of products. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I showed you that we're organized in under five platforms. Each of the five business leaders, including myself, is, is really a CEO of those businesses. Uh, we have board meetings with each of those business units on a bi-monthly basis, where I actually travel out to Racine, Wisconsin, and meet with the board of Insincorator for a day. Uh, we have a management process at Emerson that uh, is really believes in a lot of business unit autonomy, but there's, there's central controls built in. Uh, we have a process that, you know, we, we just got through with our corporate planning conference. We brought, brought in our top 300 leaders from all over the world. We tell them what our strategy is going to be with, with their input throughout the year. And then we have a series of follow-up meetings, including the divisional board meetings. But the CFO and each of the presidents comes in quarterly. We have what we call President's Council to report on, you know, the current quarter's results and how they're doing on the year. Then we have a, a corporate planning, a, a business unit planning conference process where the CEO and myself and, and several others sit in where we talk about five-year strategic planning. We keep that separate from profit planning. We have a five-year profit planning process that's different. It sounds like a whole lot of planning and meetings, but uh, I would say in, in, in my job, my day job, not my philanthropy <laughs> job, I spend about 50% of my time in planning and execution uh, in attending these different meetings with, with my subordinates to go over where we are, are we on track, if we're off track, how we can get back on. So we've, we've been at this a long time, and uh, the Emerson management process is has been written up in a lot of different uh, a lot of different institutions colleges and universities so it's working it's still working but it's a it's a decentralized process with a lot of central controls so if you're if you're on the road you're fine if you get off the road you're in deep doo doo so, <laughs> corporate's here and we're here to help you we're here to help you so, yes affect your planning and projections? Not short term. No, no, it, it really didn't. Uh, I'll have to be honest with you and, and tell you that we were disappointed in the outcome uh, for long term. But, you know, we, we can deal with it. 
we'll deal with it. I, I don't think it's going to change our short-term investment outlook. And we we're, actually, as I said earlier, we're very optimistic about the next few years in the U.S. and North America. So we think that uh, we'll probably be making a lot of investments here. So. Yeah, Don. Mm-hmm. You didn't mention India. You didn't mention India. Yeah. I'm curious. We have, we have a lot of investments in India, primarily in network power and process management. Um, in my business, climate technologies, and some of the other businesses, we have very little investment there. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting country to do business in. Um, I, I call it democracy run amok. I mean, we have an election every four years. They have an election every four months. Um, so it's hard to it's it's hard to get a handle uh, on where to invest, uh, as opposed to China, where it's a centrally planned economy. You know exactly where you stand at every step of the way, and where to invest. India is just the opposite. So, but we're making investments there. We'll do. I think we'll do about half a billion dollars in India this year. Any more questions? questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate Pat Lai and Emerson Electric for showing up today. It was a magnificent program. We learned a lot. And on behalf of the RCTA and the people in the audience, here's a token of our appreciation. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Appreciate it. So, thank you thank very you. much. Um, um, our next Breakfast with the Gazelles program will be probably January. We have to create the, the uh, program, and you will all get notification of where, when, when they will be. Hopefully, we'll have as great a program as we had this year. And today, we had, we had a great, I think, a great uh, lineup of speakers. And so we'll get started on, on uh, doing some more. So you, you'll get notifications. Uh, drive carefully, be safe out there. Thank you very much and have a very happy Thanksgiving.